equals a. Today, we're going to talk about the principle of identity. A is equal to all other A's. B, B. The principle of identity is the simplest possible statement, a tautology. The fact that A is the same as any other A is trivial. What else is there to say? Yet, despite its triviality, it is necessarily true. There is no situation where it isn't the case that A is equal to all other A's. Not just that, but according to 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger, it is the highest principle of thought. From the principle of identity springs forth the principle of non-contradiction, which simply states that A cannot both equal itself and that which is not A. We also get the law of the excluded middle, which states for every statement made, A is A, it must be either true or false, otherwise it is meaningless. Despite its necessity, despite its alleged status as the highest principle in the hierarchy of rules governing thought, we are still left with the fact that this statement is trivial. Trivial. Yet, when we engage in thinking about a thing which has attracted our attention, it often happens that the thing being thought undergoes a change. It becomes different. The thing which has our attention is the principle of identity. A is equal to A. In Latin, the word identical is idem, and in ancient Greek, it is to auto, which means the same. But the core of this principle lies in that A is itself the same for itself. There is a fundamental unity between a thing and itself. The principle of identity is only secondarily claiming that all A's are equal to all other A's. It is only when we start identifying different objects with each other that we run into the trivialities of tautologies. In Heidegger's 1957 lecture, The Principle of Identity, he takes us back to the meaning of identity in Plato. We can find this more primordial meaning in Plato's dialogue, The Sophist. In talking about rest and motion, stasis and kinesis, it is said, quote, Each one of them is different from the other two, but itself the same for itself. Plato specifically uses the word eoftu, which means each thing itself is returned to itself. Each itself is the same for itself, with itself. We aren't just splitting hairs here. Heidegger points out, quote, Sameness implies the relation of a with that is a mediation, a connection, a synthesis, the unification into a unity. A equals A clearly doesn't get us to the root of the principle of identity, a is A gets us a little closer. What is the significance of a thing being with itself? How does this escape tautological triviality? The principle of identity speaks to the unity between being and beings, which are not identical. We understand being from the ancient Greek ousia, itself derived from parousia, which literally means presence or to be present. All entities share one thing in common, that they are present that they have being in them. But the concept of being is not itself an entity. We cannot reduce big B being to those entities which have being. This is the ontological difference. The difference between being and all the entities which have being, i.e. are present. We can point to things which are present, but we cannot point to presence in itself. Being escapes the determination of language into a thing. And the principle of identity specifically says everything identifies with its being, its way of presencing, a presence which is the unity of all the parts of a thing with itself. Heidegger says, quote, The unity of identity forms a basic characteristic in the being of beings. Everywhere, wherever, and however, we are related to beings of every kind. We find identity making its claim on us. If this claim were not made, beings could never appear in their being. Because entities are with themselves in their different ways of presencing, thinking beings, beings with consciousness, like ourselves, are able to point to a rock and represent it with language. Language is about making manifest what one is talking about. Again, this sounds trivially obvious, but in making manifest, we let a thing be seen in its being. 
we use language to determine the different ways of presencing an entity might have. In being present, a rock can be a decoration, a weapon, a sacred vessel, an inconvenience, a resource, and so on and so forth. And so on and so forth and so 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 In this ontological identification or ontological sameness, we see all these different ways a thing can be unified, can be itself. But we are not done with the to-auto sameness. We must go back further than Plato. We do this because as we peel back the layers of metaphysics, it shows cracks, conflicts, or impasses we face if we maintain the principle of identity as a mere tautology. Heidegger's whole philosophical project is the destruction of philosophy, or the deconstruction of philosophy back to its origins, to the original meanings in the same way you peel an onion to get to its core. Heidegger thinks the tradition of metaphysics has become so abstract, so sterile, that it has lost the meaningful content which burst forth in the thought of the earliest thinkers. Western metaphysics has explained identity as a characteristic of being, and has forgotten a fuller, more pregnant meaning to the to-auto. Even with Plato, the thing which resembles the eternal forms is still determined by being. The reason this is an insufficient understanding of the principle of identity is because our thinking keeps pointing us downwards, towards the ground of this principle. Identity as an identical tautology. Identity as a unity determined by ontological sameness. It isn't as if these are wrong ways of understanding the principle of identity. They obviously have validity, meaning, and utility. Thinking as a critique, and all thinking should be critical, is about getting to the root of what is being thought. Ontological sameness, the identity of an entity with its being, is not grounded on identification. This is merely the product, 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 product. Being must lay claim to beings in its identification with entities precisely because there is an original difference between being and beings. Even the identification between being and object is both plural with regards to the thing and completely different with regards to other things. While identification is pointing us towards sameness, sameness is not necessarily pointing us back towards identity. The ground of sameness seems to be based on Going back further than Plato, to the pre-Socratic philosopher Parmenides. Parmenides states in the fragmented work The Proem, quote, For the same, perceiving, thinking, as well as being. Heidegger says regarding this quote, different things, thinking and being, are here thought of as the same. Heidegger is not saying that thinking and being are identical in the way we might apply the principle of identity today. Far from it. Instead, according to Heidegger, Parmenides is saying that these two different things, thinking and being, are the same and that they are determined by a more primordial belonging together. Heidegger says, quote, thinking and being belong together in the same and by virtue of the same. The sameness of to-auto means a belonging together, a belonging together that being is itself determined by, and through which both being and thinking mutually reinforce each other. That sameness is closer to belonging together than dull and dreary identification is no surprise. Sameness stressed the unification inherent in identity. In belonging together, we have two options of which our task is to determine which is the ground of which and what does that reveal to us. We could stress the together of belonging together, the belonging would be determined by togetherness. Heidegger says of this interpretation, quote, to be assigned and placed into the order of a together, established in the unity of a manifold, combined into the unity of a system, mediated by the unifying center of an authoritative synthesis. It is the whole which is greater than the sum of its parts, as determined by being, or it is a name as determined by us thinking beings. Quote, philosophy represents this belonging together as a nexus and connexio, the necessary connection of the one, the other. 
but together leaves us with an objectivity in that being determines an entity, or a subjectivity in that thought determines how beings are represented in language as think. But thinking beings, like ourselves, aren't purely one or the other. There is a type of thinking which transcends the duality of objectivity versus subjectivity, this type being the ground upon which such a duality could even spring. Thinking beings are in a unique relationship to being. Inanimate things have no way of experiencing being, no openness to the multiplicity in being. Rocks? They don't give a shit about nothing. On the other hand, living things, whether the humble single-celled organism, the ant, a weed, fungi, cicada larvae, etc., and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth, they certainly experience the being of things. All living beings are able to transmit information, respond to the world around them. But it seems for most living things, this openness is extremely limited, only what is necessary instinctively to adapt and survive. There does not seem to be openness to being in its full multiplicity with these creatures as compared to humans. The thinking of humans has a unique openness to being, which allows for things like representation, language, history, tool usage, religions, and ideologies. Descartes called us res cogitans, or thinking things, while Aristotle called us rational animals, zoon, logon, ekon. Humans are the animals with logos, with the word, determined by thought or nuos. According to Aristotle, thought is that which is receptive to the forms or ideas of a thing, to a thing's way of being. In its receptivity, thinking, or noaim, apprehends, or takes hold of the being of a thing. This is the ground from which springs representational thinking. Already prevalent in Aristotle's thought, and later on in Western philosophy, the subjective-objective duality. This ground is not itself a duality in opposition. It is the exact opposite in the case of the belonging together of being and thinking. Being and thinking reciprocally determine each other within the sameness from which they spring. Here, it is the belonging which determines the together. For when thinking apprehends the being of things, it does so in a way which allows being to be exactly what it is supposed to be in entities, the ontological identification. It is from this original axis this letting be of being by thought that thinking beings can then force their will onto nature in the form of representational thinking or modern technology. In Heidegger's magnum opus, Being in Time, he describes thinking beings like ourselves as a clearing, lichtung, a space where being is allowed to be itself, where the multiplicity of being is apprehended by thought, in the same way that water might fill a bottle or a vase. Beings fill the emptiness, which is a thinking being. In the clearing of thought, being is present. Heidegger says, quote, Man and being are appropriated to each other. They belong to each other. The sameness of being and thinking, their mutual belonging together, is what we have been searching for in the destruction of the metaphysical principle of identity. Richard Polt describes the belonging together as, quote, The event that is a unique happening that would found intelligibility. All intelligibility. All understanding is grounded in this original belonging together of being and thinking. What are we to even call this belonging together? It is already incredibly difficult to speak of being and thinking without reducing them to entities. Heidegger hesitantly describes the belonging together as the event of appropriation, a term which is not a mere happening or a discrete occurrence. This is already a crude translation of the German word Heidegger uses, Ereignis, which Heidegger readily admits cannot be determined properly. According to Heideggerian scholar Richard Capobianco, quote, Ereignis is the originating as the simple temporal letting be of beings, the serene laying out and gathering together of beings, the gentle appropriating of beings, each unto itself and each in relation to one another. In other words, Ereignis as the way of all things. This is similar to the Chinese Tao of Taoism, which is at best translated as the way, in the same way a trail in the woods is a way to follow. This is something Heidegger points out in the essay, especially the way both Aragnus and Tao both escape linguistic determination. Chapter 1 of the Tao De Jing by Lao Tzu says, quote, The Tao that can be spoken of is not the Tao itself. The name that can be given is not the name itself. Like being and thinking, the Tao cannot be understood as any type of entity. Unlike being and thinking, the Tao escapes linguistic or mathematical determination. The Tao's temporality transcends the present, so any attempt to grasp it in the now cannot describe the Tao itself. Aragnus 
and DAO. These terms are so similar that I myself think we can use them interchangeably in order to better grasp this belonging together. DAO escapes language. The DAO withdraws from the thinking being, and no matter how hard one chases the DAO, they can never catch up. Chapter 14 of the Dao De Jing says, The DAO is formless, soundless, and immaterial. Because of this, the DAO, quote, is the evasive. Approach it, you cannot see its face. Go after it, you cannot see its back. So, Aragnus, the sameness that is the belonging together of being and thinking, is not only the creation of a space for being and thinking to mutually appropriate each other, but is also a withdrawing from being and thinking. This withdrawing is not a deficit, and certainly not a negation. It is necessary of a Ragnus and or Tao, for thinking could not apprehend anything if it were not chasing continuously after the Tao. In the withdrawal, a path is opened up for thinking to continuously make the sameness between being and beings. For thinking to continuously make intelligible the gift of being, of the presence within all things. And here we are, at the limits of language, trying to understand that which is inherently unintelligible. This is what thinking is, the apprehension of the unintelligible through the belonging together of being and thinking. And philosophy, the love of wisdom, is precisely the study of thought of this boundary between the intelligible and unintelligible. Heidegger says, quote, to think of appropriating as the event of appropriation, or Agnes, means to contribute to this self-vibrating realm. Thinking receives the tools for this self-suspended structure from language. For language is the most delicate and thus the most susceptible vibration, holding everything within the suspended structure of the appropriation. We dwell in the appropriation inasmuch as our active nature is given over to language. Within the event of appropriation, thought apprehends the unintelligible and allows being to ontologically identify with the unintelligible, thereby forming the ground for intelligibility. So what does Aragnus, or Tao, have to do with identity? Well, nothing. But identity has everything to do with Aragnus, or Tao. Within this way, we find nothing that could possibly be considered identical. We find the exact opposite an endless sea of unintelligible differences. Eragnus is the space of the singular tantum, singular as such, completely unique, the ground upon which uniqueness and novelty spring. Identity is grounded in the belonging together of a difference which is always necessarily different from itself. In our thinking about this highest of principles, the principle of identity, we have come a long way from tautologies. As Heidegger states, quote, the event of appropriation is that realm, vibrating within itself, through which man and being reach each other in their nature, achieve their active nature by losing those qualities with which metaphysics has endowed them. Identity originated from an understanding of sameness, which itself was not identification, but the unity of differences into a thing which is the same with itself. We went further to the limits of language in an attempt to understand non-entities like being and thinking. We discovered there was a sameness where these two spring from, and also that this sameness inherently withdraws from us in a way which is necessary for being and thinking to appropriate each other. Because we remain focused on the necessity of the principle of identity, we were able to strip away the trivialities that Western metaphysics has burdened the principle with. And now, a present for those that identify with me. Thank you to my patrons for sharing in our sameness. Thanks for falling into one of my strange corners. I'll see you the next time you make a wrong turn. Bye!